Good morning, everyone. Thanks for attending our session today. Uh, my name is Kevin Navertel, and I'm a political science professor and the Democracy Commitment Coordinator. And as part of the Democracy Commitment, we have started an initiative about a year ago where we try to uh, take issues that are controversial, that sometimes elicit some pretty heated conversations, and uh, we call it difficult conversations, where we take an issue and, and try to break it down and, and have a civil discussion about it, but also provide a forum for you know different perspectives and um, in, encourage all kinds of um, people to participate to where you can share your opinion on the on the issue, kind of taking it off the the internet of of anonymous uh, comments that get often pretty heated. So appreciate you coming today and for those who are watching virtually online um, for today's event on monuments, public space, and history in the 21st century. Uh, so I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Professor Josh Fulton, a history professor. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Josh. And um, I just wanted to kind of provide a little bit of context. So in the past few years, there's been many cities that um, have grappled with removing public monuments of central historical figures, um, including uh, Confederate leaders and uh, Christopher Columbus um, and the likes of those. So I wanted to uh, start off by asking Professor Fulton to make a case for why we should remove some of these uh, statutes that statues that have been around for generations. Okay. Oh, okay. That's a fun way to start. Um, so the case for why we should remove them. Now, do you mean simply remove them from site in public space? Or do you mean like we put some satchel charges around them and we blow them up and sort of that kind of thing? Uh, I want to clarify before I. Uh, well, respond. I'd like you to distinguish what you would suggest might be the the best possible way to handle some of these statues in question. Ah, okay, okay. Um, my own part. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's one good way. Uh, what I would say is. Uh, public spaces are often value judgment laden spaces for communities. And in the case of these kinds of statues, there has been an overarching series of value judgments that were placed generations ago by particular sections of community uh, affirming the actions uh, and the institutions that these individuals stood for. I think obviously they should be removed uh, because monuments and statues and these kinds of things are not history. Uh, however, what's done with them after removal, uh, I think is up for debate uh, because if we want to say that public space, physical public space, um, you know, is in and of itself a place that should be for the entire community, uh, sort of that kind of thing, um, you know, then maybe some sort of conversation around putting them in museums or something where they can be difficult conversations about move, you know, part of difficult conversations about movements in American history. Um, you know, because clearly when it comes to the Confederate statues, that's a reflection of movements, right? A certain lost cause movement, especially. Um, but it's going to depend certainly on, on the statue or on the monument, right? That kind of thing. Uh, or flat out removal because, you know, the Confederacy was a bunch of traitors. So. So I, I should remind our, our group here, uh, if at any point you have a question or you uh, a comment, this is an open dialogue, so so feel free to participate. We, we do have a microphone that we can pass around for anybody who has a, a comment. So um, with that in mind, um, I'm, I'm thinking some opinion polls have shown like roughly 44% of the public would like these statues to remain. Um, so how do you make these decisions of removal? Like who, what group or um, is, you know, do you let uh, a vocal minority make this decision? Like how do you, 
How do you decide the process, I guess, and, and who is involved in mm -hmm. the, the decision making of statue removal? Well, I think you said you said 44% was for keeping or for removing? So according to a Quinnipiac University poll in June, yeah. there was 44% of people who think that these statues should remain. Should remain. Should remain. Okay. Okay, so you've got a majority that is in favor of removal. Potentially. Potentially. You've got a sizable number of people who might be unsure or don't know. Sure. I mean, when it comes to most of these kinds of things, right? So when we're talking specifically about the lost cause or we're talking specifically about the Confederacy, right? Monuments in and of itself to the Confederacy can take many forms. They don't necessarily need to be physical statues, right? So they can be anything from Confederate laden symbols uh, that have been related to, you know, the flags of state governments. They can be names, right? Sort of that, that kind of thing. And so this is a process that would then have to play out along a lot of fronts, right? Uh, so it's a process that would have to involve, you know, let's say if it's a small town in an area where they have you know a, a confederate monument sort of in that town or something like that right it would obviously on public land right. uh it would obviously have to involve robust democratic debate and perhaps putting something up for a vote within that community uh for something to be removed um you know certainly you know there have been states in the last couple of years getting involved to say no you can't do that uh you know passing laws disallowing the right to take anything down um, you know, but certainly there would have to be something, you know, um, uh, a, a, a aggressive debate, um, you know, and, uh, you know, a, a proposal sort of put forward. It just makes me wonder if, a, let's say, in one of these small, smaller communities, if 51% yeah. of the population would like these statues to remain and, you know, less than that would, would like them to be removed, then, um, do you go to kind of majority opinion? Do you, do you make things in the democratic process where whichever side has more support decides, or is it the merits of the arguments? Like, how do you? I mean, I think that that's something that if you, if 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 community doesn't necessarily work, then you can you know county and then state and sort of that kind of thing to build broader sort of coalitions, um, because you know when these things were put up, you know what they are a reflection of. Um, you know, uh, is of course not, um, you know, is very antithetical in many ways uh, to how we view view America anyway, so. And I should say that you're not necessarily the leader of the statue removal committee. Um, no, no. And, and nor am I the proponent of statues remaining, but we're trying to frame some of the potential arguments that are out there and, and trying to provide context for yeah, I mean, I would say the folks who are pro removal, you know, they, th it's the idea of pro removal, but then what do you do once it's removed, right? It's the um, th part of that argument is, you know, put something in a museum and have a conversation about the lost cause and race uh, in the country. Others are just blow it up uh, because it, when these were installed, they were about not real, you know, monuments aren't history, right? They're a reflection of, of certain aspects of, of cultural movements and values and sort of this kind of thing. And then you have to look at what were the values of, that were put into granite form and that were entrenched with these things, um, you know, and those, those values were, were pretty awful. So we use kind of evolving norms and values as kind of, um a contributing factor to make these decisions and in doing so does that erase our history uh no because th the manner in which these were con the the history that was constructed in order to justify the placement of these things wasn't really the actual history in the first place okay so then why now like what is it about this current era, let's say, with of the last few years. Because the actual activists won't necessarily get lynched now. Well, let me let me put that a different way too. Okay. So like why do you think this topic is so prominent in 2022 or let's say in the past few years? Whereas, you know, when I was in college, I just don't really remember this being a 
um, a prominent debate. Like, I don't remember there, and it, there could have been, but um, it seems that, it, you know, media coverage and activists uh, have been much more involved in trying to remove um, these types of statues in the last few years. So what is it about this modern era that... I think really sort of two, two or three things. One is truly the idea that um, the power of sort of the power of white supremacist groups, the power of those who would through violence quash anyone who might uh, object uh, has fallen so much that we are more open to public dialogue uh, about it. Uh, in that when these were originally installed, there's sort of two or three eras, right? So the, the first era is really the 1890s, early 1900s, 19 teens, you know, 10s, 20s, that era. Uh, and then you've got a, a secondary era in the 1950s and the 1960s and early 1970s. And in the case of both of those eras, right, the idea of someone who is not white in say Alabama or Georgia or someplace, you know, gathering together a, a group of individuals to publicly oppose, you know, a monument to someone uh, like Nathan Bedford Forrest, who, you know, is a leader in starting the KKK, uh, that wasn't gonna go well for them, right? Uh, so we, are more accepting, you know, despite the many difficulties that we obviously have today uh, about public discourse, there is a somewhat greater acceptance of public discourse um, in a way that would not have been appreciated at that point. And then the, the other element to that is a greater appreciation and understanding that the lost cause movement was actually a real thing, is actually a real thing, is still alive and well, uh, and has denuded and diluted uh, our understanding of uh, this history. Okay. Um, so we've meant, you've mentioned just a, a, f a few different potential statues. Like, is there kind of, could you lay out kind of like the, is the, can we distinguish between some of the Civil War um, leaders um, like a General Lee, and, and you mentioned, um, do you, like, could you mention maybe some of the ones that you would put as, like, the, the necessary, like, need to be removed right away versus ones that um, are, are not quite as clear-cut? I'm thinking of, like, Christopher Columbus, like, where that might fit in, um, because it, it seems like we've primarily just been on Civil War leaders. Like, so how, how do some other historical figures fit in, like? In just in this country or? Well, that's a separate question. <laughs> that's a separate well, question. Let's start uh, with the United States. Let's start with the United States, right? So the way this debate um, is centered around mostly is anyone is anyone or anything who's associated with the Confederacy. Okay. Uh, because, you know, let, let's look at what the Confederacy was, right? So spring of 1861, you've got a collection of US states that take votes of secession, right? say that they're not in America anymore, right? They say that they are now an independent country, right? They proclaim themselves to be so. They give themselves a constitution, which you know plagiarizes the American constitution and gives very liberal allowances for slavery. They have these secession declarations where in it they sort of say that, yeah, they say that the, the, the position of their states are you know, thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. They raise an army right, of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Uh, and, you know, we have for generations used this, oh, it's Union versus Confederate. No, these folks took up arms against the Constitution of the United States and killed U.S. soldiers, killed American soldiers. Um, so the debate around it with the Civil War has nothing to do with the U.S. It has only to do with the Confederacy. Uh, purely and simply. And in terms of a number, right, you're looking at somewhere over, I believe the Southern Poverty Law Center puts it at over like 1,200 uh, monuments across the country, uh, of which, you know, you're looking at Virginia and the state of Texas and some of these others uh, as having the highest number. Lee certainly being uh, someone who is, 
quite prominent in terms of the number of monuments uh, that have been built in his honor uh, over the years. And his legacy in the early 1900s uh, was sort of resurrected as this almost near God-like figure. Um, in terms of non-Civil War related, in the U.S., a lot of times uh, these this discussion is often centered around yeah, uh, figures like Columbus, maybe not necessarily just him, but figures related to, you know, the conquest of the Americas, uh, because, you know, there, and, and I get, right, the installation of why Columbus Day became a thing, right, the idea was to have um, Italian Americans and, and others and, and, and Catholic immigrants be able to feel better uh, about their place within the American story. And that's, you know, that in and of itself is fine. It's wonderful. Uh, however, uh, we've started to take stock and have a better appreciation of what that process of colonization actually meant for indigenous communities. Uh, and recognized actually was pretty terrible. Uh, and maybe we shouldn't place a value judgment in a positive way then uh, on the folks who kind of took the the leading sort of steps in that. So I, I, I know like just in Chicago, that's been a controversial, I don't know the best word to use, but um, right. Mayor Lightfoot and, and some of the leaders for, um, you know, uh, Italian heritage groups have really um, battled over this. And, you know, many of those groups are insisting that the, the, the statues remain or be put back, um, that it's, you know, that the contributions of of uh, Columbus to <laughs> just, you know um, so could you could you speak a little bit about you know just a, more of that particular case maybe of like Chicago and um, the the Columbus statutes like um, I, I can't speak to necessarily to the installation of all of those particular statues but what I I can generally say is that. Many of these are going to be built and installed, you know, 1930s, 1940s, right? So that's, you know, Mussolini era uh, for, for Italy. Um, there is sort of that nationalistic aspect of it. Uh, but that part of this was a, an attempt, a clear attempt, um, because in the first decades of the 20th century, uh, you had clear discrimination in the U.S. against anyone who was Catholic, uh, you had discrimination against folks from Italy, particularly southern Italy. Uh, and there was a desire to put forward and say, no, um, you know, Catholics and Italians have been a central part of the American story since the founding. Uh, and the Italian American community, especially in Chicago, uh, has has tied itself to, to a bit of, you know, that saying, um, you know, that there's a certain level of, of pridefulness there and appreciation there. However, it also then glosses over the realities of what was Columbus actually doing, what were the Spanish actually doing, what were the effects uh, in, the, uh, in the immediate term of that process, right? So, you know, Columbus famously lands in 1492. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a broad brush in numbers here, but... You know, a broad estimate is that there's about 25 million people living in the Americas at that particular point in time as a direct result of the process of, of conquest. And so then you've also got environment changes, war, disease, everything else. You're looking at about a 90% decline in population within the arc of 100 years as a direct result of that process. So you're looking at Columbus and those who came after being culpable theoretically then in the death of at least 20 million people anybody who's culpable in the death of millions of people probably shouldn't get a statue, uh, at least to me. Uh, so that's, I would say, would be, would be part of that. Now, there are efforts uh, on the part of some within the public history community to say, okay, well, instead of Columbus, maybe we can have conversations around uh, highlighting those within Chicago's vibrant immigrant communities mm -hmm. of the early 1900s uh, to say, yes, immigrants, Catholic or otherwise, right, 
are a part of the American story, are a welcome part of the American story, and should be highlighted as a part of the American story. Maybe we should just pick somebody else uh, as opposed to that guy, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So it makes me think of a couple different things. Um, one, the, you know, adding of new monuments instead of eradicating old ones like Columbus. And then secondly, like, so this is coming from Jeff Palmer, Scotland's first black professor, and he disagrees with taking down statues, and he warned that we're being distracted by the simple concrete action of taking down statues. And this is a direct quote from him. We don't want to leave this so that people look back in 50 years and say, you know, they took down statues, but why didn't they do something about racism? So part of the question is, is this performative? Um, do we feel like, you know, that substantively we're not really making big changes um, in that this is more um, symbolic? And why not? And so this is kind of a, a third question, if you will, so we can take these in order or in, in the order that you prefer. But why not add some, like, context to the statue? Like, so you know, uh, providing, um, you know, a brief detail of what you just explained about Columbus and, you know, um, the, the, the population that was decimated and instead of just the pure removal of a, a, a statue of providing more of a conversation piece, a difficult conversation for that monument. My question, though, would be, why does that difficult conversation need to occur in a park where I take my kid every day? Can't that happen maybe in a museum? Uh, can't that happen maybe in another space of, again, the maintenance of it and the maintenance of confronting that conversation every day is also in and of itself a value judgment. I'm not saying the conversation isn't worthwhile. It doesn't need to be held there. But if you're going to keep that one and not put a new one in, right, that's an interesting sort of aspect as well of, you know, why, you know, if we're saying this is a lie, but we're going to put up a plaque that says this is a lie, right? Uh, and say, let's talk What's about the, 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 the lie. lie. Would be the statue, the statue itself, right? Uh, of if we're saying this is a lie, and we're going to put up a, con a thing that says, that, you know, hey, so we've come to find out that this is kind of a lie, um, but talk amongst yourselves. Um, for the for the European, for 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 Europe to have come across America. That's new, and is that a lie for them? Like for, so for, like what part of it is the lie? What part of it is the lie? Um, the idea that the value judgment of, uh, well, there's a couple parts of it that are, that are the lie, right? One is, so what if it's new for them? That doesn't necessarily actually make it new. Uh, you know, there's that part of it. I mean, I've never been to Nebraska. Uh, but if I come to Nebraska and go, hey, look, this is a, oh my, uh, no, I don't get a monument uh, for that. Uh, me, me coming across that and going, hey, have you guys tried this new thing? That's, that's not monument worthy. And then the value judgment often that is placed is in this idea of an affirmative, right? A positive, that, that accomplishments make someone good uh, or by nature good in some way of, yeah, Columbus showed up here and didn't die along the way. That doesn't mean it's good. That doesn't mean that it's fundamentally good. And to your other sort of point about is this to a certain extent all this whole debate virtue signaling uh, and that we need to keep them there because if we don't, the public can't necessarily have these difficult conversations, right? That it might be necessary to keep them there. I don't know. I mean, the way that it worked in, say, for example, Germany after the war was over, they attempted to remove every symbol as possible, uh, basically made it illegal to have the symbols up in any way, shape, or form, put them in museums and had difficult conversations there. I think everybody still remembers that Hitler was a bad guy. Uh, we didn't need a monument to him to prove that, uh, you know, in some way, shape, or form. Um, but yeah, that is a concern in the idea that we've come to the point where we think monuments are history. 
that monuments in and of themselves are a replacement for the books that exist behind us right here, which they're not. Uh, the dialogue needs to not simply just be in front of uh, an edifice to something terrible. Uh, it needs to happen in these spaces. It needs to happen in classrooms. And there does need to be a better engagement with the process of the teaching of history, not only in this country, but elsewhere, but especially in this country. So I don't want to get too hung up on Christopher Columbus, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, it, it, or minimize everything that you've cataloged as okay. far as the destruction to natives and yeah. but yet in like the world was very different after 1492 and globalization right. and um so you going to nebraska i feel like is not quite the same level of significance for the worlds um uh <laughs> although it's it's a pretty nice place that's what i hear I, yeah so y y the, I, the point being is can we a acknowledge like the nuances of of these um actors in our history that you know there's positive developments and negative developments from the same actor you know like how do we or is it because any one person from the past who did anything bad is essentially canceled and you know removed from from public spaces because i i and and separate but related to, to your point about parks versus uh, mu museums and i'm just wondering like you know as a kid um how many people get to go to museums like people from lower income backgrounds and is it a, kind of an exclusive uh, elitist type place for mm -hmm. for some people the ones especially mm -hmm. that uh, charge pretty high emissions right. uh, granted there's some free days here and there but sure. um versus parks where you might have more exposure to be able to have these difficult conversations well i mean if you want to say that we want to reframe public space into a sort of dialogue zone right this sort of museum area where you you do that that's great that's great then do it uh and put up put up statues to the main figures of a wide variety of indigenous communities that were decimated as a direct result of what Columbus and Cortez and so many others did and keep Columbus up, but put them there too. Uh, but that's probably not gonna happen uh, when it comes to that kind of system, right? Uh, when it comes to that kind of level of dialogue, of when it comes to the idea of can people in the past be flawed? Absolutely. But if we maintain where their presence is in that public space, are we not still then reaffirming a certain level of that power from generations before? Um, you know, I'm all for making this a robust debate in all places. Uh, but if we simply just maintain the Columbus, right? If we put the Columbus statue back in Chicago, that's great, okay, cool. However, that's also probably gonna be where it would end, right? I mean, what would be done after that to make it a truly equitable conversation? Are we gonna put up smaller plaques to then say, you know, to sort of say, let's have a conversation just about this guy. And if we do that, we're simply centering it on that white European experience uh, because that's the focal point of the entire space. That's not okay. But it seemed like you were, um, I, I don't know, acknowledging that if there was a series of plaques to the fuller story of what occurred during this time period, that that could be potentially a, a richer experience for individuals to get not just the Columbus statue, but also. Well, a series of plaques is interesting, but if you bring back a Columbus statue and only put up a series of plaques, it seems pretty clear who is still the focal point of, if you wanna have a rich dialogue of, then Columbus doesn't just get a statue, many other people would get statues too. Uh, and I don't necessarily, you know, 
we have enough trouble finding public funds for working water. Uh, I don't think that's probably going to be in the cards. Uh, this is a question of, you know, uh, those who want a statue like that to remain feel that tied to a certain segment of their own identity. Uh, and they feel that their identity is being attacked, that they themselves are being attacked uh, by it being taken down. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, however, that's how they feel. And again, we invite our audience, if there's questions, things that we're neglecting to, to bring up, ideas that you have in your head, please help us out. Um, it, 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 a, a few moments ago, it reminded me of our former president, uh, Trump, who had, you know, made some arguments about, um, well, where do we draw the line with other historical figures, you know, mm -hmm. some of our Virginian presidents of Washington and um, Thomas Jefferson and others who may have, or who owned uh, slaves. Right. And so how do you distinguish your kind of rubric or how do you decide um, other historical figures who have flaws? that may have also had significant contributions to the country and eliminate those historical figures as well? That's a good question. Um, and again, I think part of this is the idea that we tend to nationally think that public history exists simply in the form of monuments. Public history exists simply in the form of that performative, what we sort of put out there, that much of this is a need to reframe a more holistic understanding of what we believe public dialogue and what we believe public history to be in that it can't simply just be extra plaques. It's got to be better curriculum, better dialogue in K through 12, better training that way. You know, it's got to exist. You know, we've got to have funding for better, um, more holistic uh, history sections in local libraries and sort of that kind of thing because uh, libraries are cool. Uh, there is already, but it's imperfect, I would say. It's definitely fraught with conflict, especially in plantation spaces. Uh, efforts on the part of historians, uh, black scholars, scholars of slavery, you know, sort of this kind of thing, uh, to r reframe that debate. Uh, and my understanding of it sort of centers on the idea that, okay, we can be prideful in the American story, uh, but there needs to be a upfront acknowledgement of the faults of those individuals. Uh, now, there are those who would say uh, that Washington or, you know, Jefferson and others um, – you know, that that everything for them should come down, everything, you know, for all of that sort of should come down. That is something that is, that's an ongoing debate, right? You have folks who are vehemently against anything like that, folks who are um, very much for it. Uh, they tend to be more, uh, more radical. I think what would be good now is a, a better appreciation and a better understanding of how those individuals looked at race at the time, a better appreciation uh, of plantation spaces uh, and where and how all-encompassing enslavement was at that time. That is not fundamentally good in any way. I, I think I referred to this earlier, and I'm just trying to I, – I can't think of a great way of asking this question. But, okay. Um, Privately, when we were kind of talking about having this discussion, you know, and, and kind of what led us to pick this topic and right. private conversations that we've had with family members. Sure. I'm um, thinking of like, so we, 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 you, you've said that we don't want to um, prioritize uh, eras of the past that were clearly racist and sexist and, and, and had many... Um, you know, colonial power, giving preference to the kind of era at the time, right. uh, the power structures at the time. But I wonder for those who, who worry that like history is being taught differently and, you know, critical race theory and, and kind of the uh, topics of today, especially after 
uh, the murder of George Floyd, like, are we, sure. are we giving more preference to our, like, um, opinion of the day, or not opinion of the day, but more of like, um, a different line of thinking today of, of how, you know, maybe um, history was taught in the past, and now today we're, we're much more critical look is being um, used at, at uh, history and historical figures, and you know, my future generations look back on our on our moment too, and right. and have yet another kind of interpretation and analysis of of either our moment or of moments in the past. So, what gives this moment more preference than? than the past there's it that makes me think of a lot of things and and one is no matter who's teaching history in any particular point in time there's a whenever one does it one has to acknowledge that you're never going to make everybody happy even if you're telling the truth the whole time uh everything has a history and history is inherently biased and so for many of us when we engage with history we're looking for a form of curation of the past that if we don't see it right in front of us, we get deeply incensed by it. And that goes for everybody. And in some ways, they're not, they're both right and they're wrong. Um, to your point about critical race theory and about the idea of are we transforming history and placing our own sort of presentist views on the past and is that you know inherently new uh and is that bad and is that no it's not new at all uh i would argue that historians have been placing their own understanding of how they see the past through time that the point of of history uh is to tell the truth and then telling that truth to the audience that you have and the audience that you have changes through time. So you still tell the same truth, but you frame it or phrase it in a way uh, that makes sense for them. Um, you know, the way that I like to frame this for folks often is the idea that I'm darn well prideful that we won World War II because, you know, Nazis are bad. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we didn't have faults along the way. And the question is, is it okay to acknowledge those faults? Does it make me a bad American if I acknowledge those faults? Um, you know, if I acknowledge the reality of Japanese internment during that war, right? Am I now deeply distrustful of the American story? No, we got that one wrong. That was a mistake. That was not okay. But I'm darn well prideful of what we did overall, right? And it's that question of how can you reconcile either of those? And the question of things like critical race theory, you know, and this idea of are we changing or are we doing new things, you know, the idea of are we putting this on too much, right? No, I would say that we're finally doing so, right? I mean, most of the times when folks are sort of against the idea of critical race theory, you know, asking them to define it, you know, is kind of the, the interesting thing. Uh, and it reminds me of the debate about the 1619 project of the last couple of years. And, you know, if you're, you're completely unaware, uh, the 1619 project was this project that came out of the New York Times, New York Times Magazine, a couple of years ago. And they brought in a number of scholars from a variety of fields. And what they essentially argued was two things in these dozens of articles that they put together. One was that race is a central part of the American story, and it has been since our founding. Well, if you look purely at the sources themselves, that's absolutely true, right? You know, there's no sort of preternatural sort of theory or whatever of it's there, right? That's there. Okay. Um, the other thing that they argued was that because enslavement was so central and race and power were so intertwined at the beginning of the American story, that maybe we should reframe the start of the country as being 1619 as opposed to 1776. And 1619, of course, being the year uh, that enslaved individuals from the continent of Africa arrived on American shores. Now, that's up for debate, 
right? That's a, you know, there are going to be many folks who say, yep, that's okay. Others who say no. Others, even on the left, who would say, well, that kind of negates indigenous experiences as it relates to race and power, you know, sort of, so maybe that's not a good date. That's up for debate. The idea that, that race hasn't been a part of the American story uh, since, uh, since our founding, and of course, I recognize uh, that I say that uh, as a privileged upper middle class white guy uh, who has been the beneficiary uh, of a wide variety of forms of privilege, uh, you know, often um, is, is, is silly. Uh, the, the clear evidence exists, uh, you know, with this idea that, you know, let me rephrase this. Um, that evidence has been there, uh, and so now part of this this dialogue is just sort of the idea of of bringing that out into the forefront. Yeah, thank you for that, and I, I think that in part of your conversation or, or arguments that you just provided, it made me think about your pride for America and, and winning World War II. Sure. Um, do you have nuanced views on the American flag of this flag that represents our country and in all of the good? accomplishments, but yet, as you mentioned, with internment of Japanese and slavery and, you know, the list goes on and on of, of the bad um, decisions and, and um, moments in our history. And like, how do you how do you grapple with those? And is that different than our monument discussion? Um, for me personally, uh, how do I sort of grapple with it? I mean, I see it as you know, a, 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 you know, the, the idea is that America is an idea, right? And so that's a symbol of the idea, right? Um, th that's different, you know, in a way, depending on the monument, because the Confederacy is different than America. Uh, and the Confederate flag is maybe different than, you know, the, the American flag. However, I think it absolutely, you know, is, is, is very, it's very interesting, right? Um, the debate over the idea of the, the symbol of the flag itself, right? I mean, and that's something that has transformed even in my own lifetime, even the lifetime of my parents, I mean, uh, from the U.S. flag laws that existed in, you know, the, the first half of the 20th century uh, to the more openness that one has now. But that clearly is certainly a controversial thing, uh, you know, in many ways. Are there any questions or comments that any of you from the audience have? I think we've spellbound them. Yeah. They're all shocked. There's still a, a couple more questions that I have. Sure. Um, so feel free, though, along the way to, to interject for, for anybody who might have a question or comment. Um, and this this is another, it's going to take me a while to get the, to, uh, to think of this question. But basically, I'm wondering about the blowback in kind of political ramifications of um, it seems like it, uh, after George Floyd there's been just a flurry of activity of, of, of statues either being vandalized or removed and that right. this has been a, a, a really rapid development and I'm wondering to, to those let's let's you know kind of the white um, rural um, American without a, a college degree um, that has seen a lot of change in, in their lifetime. I'm trying to picture, you know, um, some people from the rural, rural area of Nebraska where I'm from and, and other parts of the South. And there's been just a lot of significant changes in a, in a pretty short amount of time period and, and a lot of hurting in communities. And, and um, you know, I'm not connecting all of this, but I'm just saying that between globalization and manufacturing job loss and um, the rise of opioids and alcohol abuse and so many, there's just a lot of hurt going on in communities and to have now, you know, some central figures from, from you know, whether they're right or wrong, there's, there's many people who look to these monuments or flags as um, part of their identity. And so I, 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 just to the identity aspect of politics, the way that people feel that um, something's being taken from them. And I, referencing our, our former president again, who seems to um, do a good job of reaching that level of hurt uh, from Americans. And so you may win the monument war 
or battle, but lose maybe a, a larger war of trying to win the hearts and minds of, of Americans who may feel like their America is changing. So how, how would you speak to that or what are your thoughts on that? Their America is changing, and America is in and of itself changing. I don't disagree with that. I think that's absolutely true. Of there, there are you know my own America is 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 changing. Uh, everybody's America changes. Change happens. But my own sense or their sense of pain over that change. Why is that more important than somebody else's? Why is that more important than somebody else's hurt? Their laws, they're sad that their monument is gonna come down. They feel a sense of hurt. Who's that monument to? And what did that person do? How had that individual, how had maybe the ancestors of those who wanted to remain caused indelible hurt generations before and why is it that hurt isn't okay to bring up too of we're, we're connecting i mean i i get you you know i get you i get the idea that the effects of globalization the effects either have been positives and there have been negatives and especially on many rural communities across the u.s and i have family in many of those rural communities in illinois uh, the feeling of a sense of loss, the feeling of a sense that um, society views them in a negative light, uh, and there is a desire to be prideful. I get that. That's absolutely valid of wanting to be prideful in a sense of place. But, you know, most people, if you talk to them about the idea of, you know, what's it okay to be prideful over, what it's not okay to be prideful over, right? It, it varies, right? And most folks usually pick good as opposed to, to bad. You know, if you have a, a genuine conversation with folks over really what the Confederacy was, right? Many will come to a better understanding. Part of this is just, again, the idea that the lost cause narrative has so been deeply ingrained within so many minds across the country that that's what it's in and of itself needs to be shifted. You know, I'm thinking this idea of, well, doesn't their hurt need to be acknowledged, right? And I go, well, what about Silent Sam? Um, so Silent Sam was a, a monument uh, on campus uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. And it was a monument to sort of a plain clothed Confederate soldier, sort of an enlisted, enlisted soldier. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna use a, a word uh, related to uh, sexual assault here, so just to, to be aware for folks. Um, it was installed in the early 1900s, uh, and it was essentially paid for by a, a philanthropist, a white, not, not philanthropist, a white industrialist, uh, who had been a Confederate soldier himself. Uh, and in either the installation speech uh, or in coverage of the press, uh, at the time when it was installed, uh, that white industrialist said that he wanted it there because either he or a close friend of his had r raped a black woman on that specific site when he had come home from war. Uh, and he wanted that monument right there because that's what they had fought for, was the right to have power over the bodies of others. So to say you're upset that the monument is going down, that you're hurt, that that's changing. What about the hurt of that woman? What about the hurt of her family? What about the hurt of her community? How is that hurt any less valid? Uh, I think that needs to be part of this too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, you know, 
I'm trying to provide a, I, you know, I feel guilty now, um, and and thank you, but it's important for you know partly I'm 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 set I'm teeing you, you, up some yeah, softballs yeah, yeah. for you yeah to, yeah um, be able to illuminate like why this is uh, important to know the backstories of right of these of these monuments, but you know just to be clear what I was trying what and what I was trying to frame is that you know for many. It used to be many white rural Americans were Democrats, and I, I I hear this a lot that there's a lot of people who feel like the Democratic Party has left them, and I just wonder how things like this of where they feel like there's just wokeism, if you will, where there's just like a, a far left, the radical left uh. is changing their changing so rapidly and making um, aggressive decisions and uh, right. changing things, and they feel left behind by this. Right. And I certainly don't try to blame just this monument um, discussion as the prime mover, because I don't, I don't believe it to be. I, sure. I, I see it as part of the puzzle. Right. Um, but it just it makes me, and I'm not trying to say that somehow supporting um, Donald Trump is bad. I just, this make America great again, it seems like part of this... Um, campaign not just slogan but identity that again like it's referring to the past it's 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 definitely resonating with people who feel like there was an era that was better and i the, the level of passion behind it is is, is you know in, in my 40 years of, of, of living have ha, i don't know of any other candidates been able to reach that and i just wonder if this movement is going to contribute to more people being part of the MAGA movement? It's an excellent question. And I, you know, I, it makes me think of a couple of things. One is, um, I, in, in, when I'm not here teaching, one of the things that I do in, in the community that I live in is, um, we, we help run a, a community fridge and pantry. And, these are one of those those free community fridges, you know, that you see sometimes, you know, where folks can just come up and if they, they have a need, they can come and get whatever they, they need. And we're, we're partly in charge of loading the food in once a week and stuff like that. And this year especially, we've seen a huge increase in the number of people that are taking advantage of it because you all been to the grocery store. It's crazy right now, right? It's insane. You try to go buy lettuce, it's ridiculous, right? I was at the store the other day and uh, was it like three heads of, like three things of romaine lettuce was like $9. I'm like, what the, are you kidding me? Right, this is, you know, for, for you know, a, a thing of strawberries was like $7, right? And, you know, I don't think any party has a very good um, message uh, on the effects of inflation in the moment like that, of what can you prioritize and, and do. It makes me sort of think of, think of that, and it makes me think of, you know, the idea of will these folks, um, you know, or will this sort of lead folks into um, MAGA uh, or this idea of, um, you know, will this kind of lead folks towards another side of, you know, it makes me think of, of, of two, two things. W one is the shifting with the Democratic Party happened a long time ago, right? You know, I mean, you certainly can uh, talk more about the shift in, you know, the election of 64 and sort of that kind of thing, you know, sort of e extensively. Uh, but that framing of history uh, at a point of the idea of there's a point where it was good. Okay. But was it good for everybody? Was it good for those who maybe didn't look like me or didn't look like you? And I know that's something that I'll often will talk about in class is the idea, especially for the second half of U.S. history, right? So looking at, let's say, the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, right, sort of that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you weren't, you know, a certain look, a certain faith, a certain gender, a certain sexual identity, right, orientation, um, all of that, right, was it fundamentally good for you regardless of class, right? And the answer was is not often always for everybody. Uh, and so that phrase that, it, yeah, it was great at one point is, is sort of a bit of a setup, 
right? Uh, because it's the, you know the the rejoinder is okay. What specific year and how many mm-hmm. folks were included in that? Um, it makes me kind of think of a few of those elements. I think Brianna had a question. Yeah. Sure. And it, just, just to re, can you rephrase just for the people who might be sure, sure, online. sure. I mean, I think your yeah, your 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 statement or uh, comment was the idea that um, folks are becoming more active uh, in the aftermath of of the death of George Floyd, uh, and questioning, even though questioning has been going on for a while, and you know that's that's interesting and true, right? Uh, in that you, especially in 2020, uh, saw an overwhelming amount of activism. I mean, I'm so looking forward in the years to come to seeing the histories that are written, uh, about the many ways of activism that occurred that year. Uh, because much like, uh, 1968 was incredibly transformational in how we think about activism. Uh, 2020 very much so, you know, arguably will, you know, probably serve a, a, a not maybe not as significant, but it's going to be darn well close uh, in terms of how sort of profound it was. And you know, I think a lot of that had to do with just the fact that his you know his death is essentially on video, right? Uh, of you know, in, much like the case of Rodney King a generation ago, right? Uh, it's when we have images, uh, it tends to shock us more. It tends to bring us more into uh, sort of focus in a certain way, rightly or wrongly. Uh, I'm reminded uh, of uh, half of my family is from a, a small farm town called Petersburg, Illinois. And the house next to where my father grew up, there was a woman who she was, she was an adult in, you know, sort of w- w- the World War II era, uh, and she was around, she was alive uh, when when 9-11 happened. Uh, and I remember she was having a conversation, she said, she said, oh no, uh, my father was asking, you know, was 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, which one was, do you remember more or worse? She said, oh, 9-11's worse. Uh, and we were like, why? Because it was all on TV. You saw all of it. It was more shocking, uh, sort of in a way. So Pearl Harbor was bad, absolutely, but you just heard about it on the radio. Uh, you didn't see folks being forced to jump from buildings to their death, uh, whereas you saw that uh, live on television uh, on the morning of, of 9-11. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really important observation that you made. Um, the murder of George Floyd being, you know, vi- uh, viewed by all Americans, and I think, you know, as a backdrop to this conversation, I really do think it was the impetus of of why now of so many uh, monuments being removed because, as you mentioned, the power structure and authority in seeing this, uh, you know, many people just fed up with the kind of structural racism. And so I think these were a great um, venue for people to attack of saying enough is enough and we're not going to have these authority figures like lurching over us in our in our communities, um, particularly in, the, in, in, in some of these southern communities. Um, 
the, the, the question I have, and this is not necessarily to, to Josh, but just for the group is like, so when history looks back, like what's really changed with, um, you know, let's say the, the uh, black white wealth gap or the segregation in our, where we live in our housing and, and because of that, our schools. And so like, what's, what's really changing at, at uh, beyond like the, these, academic discussions about what to do with monuments like what are we really doing on the ground and you're right there's been an upswell of of activism and, and that's definitely been encouraging and i just hope that it's it's uh makes significant progress i you know to your to your point it makes me think okay if something comes down great okay how does this lead to the end of the lost cause movement I mean, that's been the real scourge for so long with a lot of this, right? Of, you know, the Lost Cause movement was a coordinated effort in the aftermath of the American Civil War to redefine uh, the relationship of race to the American South, uh, what the antebellum South actually was, redefine what the experience of enslavement actually was, and then redefine what the Confederacy actually was, uh, and especially its leaders, as a way to, for those recovering in the aftermath of a brutal war, to be able to look back pridefully on their experiences even though they lost. And in many ways, that movement won in terms of how they framed for so many Americans uh, how they understand the war to be. You know, when the Lees and others are, are talked about, it's the idea, okay, maybe they were on the other side, but they were good men too. No. Th that, yes, has changed. But, you know, we can find out that somebody who we thought was good maybe wasn't that good. And it's hard to come to that realization but we can move forward and we can adapt. It's just that, yeah, we're in a time where folks get angry, right? Folks are getting very, very upset. Um, but the, the power of the lost cause movement and your point earlier about, is this in some ways virtue signaling? Time will tell in terms of how we teach this, not just me or you, uh, but I'm talking, you know, middle schools and high schools around the country. I'm talking community colleges around the country. I mean, um, you know, whether we require the teaching of history more, because in many cases we don't, uh, whether or where we require it and what we require out of it, right? Sort of that, that kind of thing. I mean, we are still living in a reality where the base level understanding for a sizable number of folks is they don't believe that slavery had much of anything to do with the Civil War. Uh, that slavery is bad, they'll agree to that premise usually. Um, however, they don't believe it's a, a root cause of the war itself. So partly earlier we were, I, I had mentioned, uh, related to this, is this a global um, movement? Is there a global, are other countries grappling with some of these same monument re removals and, and clearly it what's unique to the united states is having the civil war of of these particular sure. leaders but can you speak at all to whether there's other countries that are having these internal discussions and oh absolutely i mean i'm i'm not a scholar of this but you know i i've read a bit and what i can say yeah absolutely you know in the couple years um after so 2020 you started to see efforts to take down statues in the uk uh, a lot of that had to do with the fact that the slave trade for generations was corporatized and run out of the UK. And so you have these individuals who become very, you know, the UK likes to be very prideful about its abolition of enslavement. Great, that's cool. But that doesn't mean the generations of folks who had been doing the enslaving beforehand, you forget about that. And they did for a very, very long time. And so there was an effort to get rid of some of those statues. Um, now, it also extended itself not just to maybe prominent enslavers, but it extended itself in some cases to 
uh, British political leaders. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of, of Winston Churchill. Uh, now, you know, Churchill's always f fun to talk about because, well, you know, uh, the amount of alcohol consumed, uh, you know, sort of that kind of stuff. Uh, however, uh, it's sort of that idea of, you know, that question of him being a very flawed figure uh, in that he's prominently at the head of one of America, you know, uh, the, the forces opposing Nazism, uh, but his track record as an imperialist is not all that great. Uh, and his track record in India, especially with the famine that happens in the 1940s, not that great. Uh, and so you have some who say, well, you need to tear down anything that would relate to Churchill. And so, you know, there's been a lot of effort to protect Churchill statues and there's been dialogue in the UK about this. Um, in Germany, the, the interesting thing that I've seen, there was a great book like 20 years ago, it was called Divided Memory. And it's all about the Holocaust in Germany because, you know, right after World War II is over, the Holocaust, uh, you know, as it has sort of occurred, you get this divided and occupied German state uh, where you have two different German states, each dominated by these opposing forces. And so then the question is, who runs what state? How does the process of memory occur for both of these, right? In East Germany, you're gonna have this kind of Soviet, right, influence with things. And so the memorialization process there is gonna be heavily centered on certain elements. Whereas in West Germany, it's gonna be very heavily centered on other elements. Now, after reunification between 89 and 91, you have a process of trying to open up that memory, dialogue with that memory much better. Uh, but it's not perfect. Uh, there was um, an article in The Atlantic recently, I think by Clint Smith, who's a great scholar and a great writer, um, you know, saying that, that Germany is somewhat of a model for some of this. There are gaps, right, in, in a lot of what, uh, what the Germans uh, have, have done with this, right? So the, the uh, attacks against the Roma, attacks against the uh, LGBTQ plus community, right, sort of during the 30s and 40s, you know, in some of the memorializations, maybe hasn't gotten as much focus, right? Um, so it's kind of an ongoing dialogue about how to continually do it better. And I think that's one thing, is that idea of m maintaining community engagement with scholars as well about how memorialization is in and of itself not static, it's ongoing. Uh, and needs to be. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of great scholars in this, both in Germany and elsewhere. Well said. Um, we're down just our final couple minutes. I wanted to just provide one other opportunity if there's any other questions or comments from our audience. Well, thank you. Thank you for attending today. And, you know, I obviously in, in, in the time that we had, we can't cover every dimension of this topic, but I think we provided a lot of uh, good framework to understand. And um, it, this is a, a hot topic and one that I, I hope that we as uh, community members continue to have uh, difficult conversations with. So thank you to Professor Fulton and thanks for all of you for attending and um, appreciate all your contributions. Thanks everybody. Thank you.